just devote this time, God, solely to you, Lord. We just want to rejoice, Lord. We just want to praise you, God, for all that you are, Lord. For the goodness that you bring into our lives, Lord. For the, the endless grace, Lord. The endless mercy, Lord. The endless love that you have for each and one, every one of us, God. We can't thank you enough, Lord. This moment, Lord, we just want to praise you to the fullest, God. We just want to praise you, Lord. Go before us, God, and lead us and anoint us, Lord. Let your word go out, Lord, that it would touch our hearts, God, that it would speak to us, Lord.
voices. There is no I belong to you. 
giving you honor and praise that you deserve. It's a honor, Father, to worship you, God. Have this ability to come up here and use our talents to sing and play, Father. We don't do this for our own honor and glory, God. This is all for you, Lord. We heard the voices out there, God, and the beautiful voices singing to you, Lord, praising you, Lord. Praising the fact of what you've done in our lives, continue doing our lives, Lord. So we ask, Lord, if it's in your will, Father, just bless this time. Bless this time as we uh, continue worshiping you now by hearing your word from Pastor Ruben, Lord. To bless, bless his message that you've given him, Lord. And let us take in whatever that message is, Lord. Let us just take in and listen. Let us go and let you in, Father, more and more every day. It's a challenge for we're sinners, Lord. I know I'm a big, the biggest sinner here in this room, Father. But I know you, you have mercy over me and you have mercy over all of us, Lord. As long as we take steps forward towards you, Lord, that's all you want us to do. Steps forward, not back. We thank you, Lord. We ask this in your name and we pray. Amen. 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 Let's all greet one another. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody outside in the courtyard. Glad to have you here. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Hey, before we get started in the bulletin, I want to want to uh, appeal to you. I want to appeal to you, Facebookers. Who's a Facebooker here? Who likes getting on Facebook? You all know what a watch party is. Anybody know what a watch party is? How many know what a watch party is? Only a few. So if you get on Facebook right now, let's let's do that together right now. Get on Facebook and then look up um, our live uh, feed right now, which is going on. Um, I'm actually recording right there by the speaker. You, I don't know if you noticed that before, but our phone is right there and it's recording everything live on Facebook. But if you go to Facebook and you go to Calvary Chapel Inland and you see our live feed there, underneath your feed is going to say, watch this video with your friends. How many see that? That's what they call a watch party. And if you just click start, that will start this live video on your wall and it will go to all your friends will be invited to it. So what a neat way to reach out and you don't even have to leave the church. You don't even have to speak to anybody. 
<laughs> All you have to do is just push start and it will start a watch party and they just get an invitation while they're doing whatever they're doing and either they want to watch or they don't want to watch. It's up to them. So how many saw that? Can you, no one seen it? Mm -mm. You got to first get to the, to the live feed there. Are you in the live feed? Yeah. Yeah. And you see now, now minimize it. Don't, you don't want to open it up. You want to minimize it so you can actually scroll down and see other things. And then there should be a little start button there that says watch party. You got it? So at least one of us got it. I'm going to start mine right now. So. So all my friends now will watch. And then and it says start watch party. And then I just push start. And now there's a watch party. So if you didn't get it, then forget it. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but we're all out of bulletins, which is a good thing. So if you have a neighbor that has one, you might want to look, look to their bulletin. But we have a few announced. Oh, boy. Okay, well, turn the volume down on your watch party. <laughs> I didn't do that. So sort of laughing. And it's delayed, too. A um, couple of announcements. We have a meeting July 1st, guys, that are involved in the men's retreat in October. So we'll meet July 1st at 6.30 here at the church. We're opening up the church on 4th of July at um, 4 p.m. I lost my place there. Uh, bring your favorite dish as far as country theme. So fried chicken, chicken fried steak, potatoes, you know, that, that type of stuff. And we're just going to meet here and just have fellowship, uh, see what the Lord does, maybe play some, some worship, and then just, just fellowship with one another. Those of you that may not have a place to go, I'm not sure if we'll see fireworks. I'm sure we'll see community, illegal fireworks somewhere. <laughs> that always happens in our community. So come on out and bring two liter bottle of soda and some dessert and we'll just fellowship. Baptism meeting is today. Those of you that are, are going to get baptized on July 7th, please stay after the service, after the fellowship. We'll meet here in the church and we're going to have a little study on baptism and what it is and what you're doing. We have about, I believe it was 10 to 12 people getting baptized, which Praise is God. a good number. Amen. Amen. So please, today, afterwards, if you can't make it for whatever reason, sorry. No. <laughs> we'll have a makeup day. We'll have a makeup day. I'll get with you and maybe a couple others on, on a different day if we need to. And usually what we do is we gather at the, at the site, which will be at my home, and we have little direction papers in the back there so you can get there. And we'll talk a little bit more about baptism before you get back to it. Now, it is at our home, so if you haven't been there, you're more than welcome to join us if you're not getting baptized and you just want to be a part of the celebration because you're a part of the fellowship here, then we invite you to come out and celebrate. Uh, bring your bring your family, bring your grandkids, whoever, because there's going to be swimming, there's going to be jacuzzi, there's going to be volleyball. This is a neat time of having fun, and then we'll have the celebration of the, of the uh, baptism. And the taco man will be there. All you can eat tacos for free. So do me a favor. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer area. Um, let me know how many you are going to bring. Not just you yourself, but if you've invited family members, what that number might be, because we want to make sure that we have enough tacos for everybody. And right now we have ordered about uh, enough tacos for 75 people. Yeah. But I'm having a feeling that some of you have invited families that you didn't put down there. So I'm thinking we might need to order for 100 people. Mm. So, and, and our house is big enough for 100 people, by the way. Yeah. Just, so, just so you're, if you're wondering how you're going to fit 100 people, not in the house, but outside of the house. <laughs> so we have, we have plenty of room to fit 200 people mm -hmm. in the home. So we've had weddings back there. It's, it's really nice, and I think you'll enjoy it. So, okay, let's ask the ushers to come forward. And as they're coming forward, one more thing. I need your prayer. As you know, every year I've been going to India and ministering to uh, the Indian people there and reaching out to the Muslims and the Hindis in the various villages of Hyderabad, which has been exciting for me. Uh, a little dangerous, but exciting. Uh, Usually when I go on short mission trips, I go alone. No one is willing to go with me. <laughs> I don't know why, but the safest place to be is where? In the hands of God, right? That's the safest place to be. So I had planned on going to India this year, but I have been praying about South Sudan for several years since I went the last time. 
and the opportunity was um, given to me this last uh, Thursday. They approached me and said, Pastor Ruben, we'd like you to be the first one to go back into South Sudan this coming October. We need somebody to teach inductive Bible study. So they asked me first, I don't know why, I'm just, I'm the guinea pig. <laughs> uh, they haven't been going into South Sudan because there's been civil war. And they're also still fighting with the northern uh, Sudan, which is Muslim. And since I've been there, there's been close to 50 chaplains that have died wow. because of the battle. So it is a dangerous place. I'm going to be on a military compound uh, ministering to, I'm not sure what the number is, anywhere from 100 to 400 chaplains. I will be teaching them how to study their Bible so that they're equipped as they go out <clears throat> and minister and also have a gun in their hand as they battle at the same time. So um, I'm planning on having one of the guys from Far Reaching Ministries come out while I'm out there to share with you what exactly South Sudan is about. But it's a dangerous place. Uh, it looks like I'm going alone again, which is fine with me. I'll be traveling from here to Dubai and then from Dubai to to Uganda and then Uganda up to the northern part of South Sudan and then travel from there two hours to South Sudan from what it seems like. So it's about 24 to 26 hours uh, to get in there. That's a long haul. Yeah. So um, I remember last time, uh, as soon as I got there, they said, so are you ready to teach? I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm ready to go to sleep because I couldn't sleep on the plane at all. But I taught and then I knocked out. And then they were knocking out, it's time for dinner. And I don't want dinner, just let me sleep. <laughs> Forget dinner. No, no, you need your strength, so get up, get up. I'm like, no, I don't want it. And they forced me up to eat, and I went back to bed. <clears throat> so it was a neat experience. <clears throat> but I just need your prayer for God's safety Absolutely. and protection. <clears throat> and if the Lord lays it on your heart, pray about it. Make sure it's the Lord that you support me. One of the reasons that I know that um, God has called me to go is when I've been praying about it, the door opened. And then there's a couple people who don't belong to our church that uh, love me very much, and I'm grateful for that, and pray for me all the time in this ministry. And immediately they, they covered half of the cost to go there. So, so I thought, okay, Lord, you're, you're leading me in that direction. So, All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we do thank you for opportunities like this, Lord, to preach the gospel message into areas, Father, that really are dangerous and, and are in opposition to that message, Lord. But, Lord, it is a message that needs to go there, Father. And we thank you for those that are there in South Sudan, those chaplains, those natives, Father, who, who love their country, who yes, love God. Jesus and are willing to risk their lives because truly, Lord, they're trained to die. They really are. They really are, Lord. They know that any moment they could pass away. And so, Lord, we pray for them and we pray for my trip, Lord, that you would just be there in the midst of all that, Lord. Father, we pray for our offerings. Father, how do we do the work of God without the children of God, Lord? We can't, Father. And it's their generosity, their love, and compassion and mercy that continue to support this ministry, Lord, and what we're doing here in this community, Father, and abroad also, Lord. And so I thank you for them, Lord, and for their faithfulness, Lord, and their willingness, Lord, to give to you, Father. That says a lot about a person when they're willing to give a tenth of what they bring into their own household, Lord. They are mission-minded, Lord, and they are Christ-like because Christ, he gave it all, Lord. He gave it all for us, Lord. And so may you bless this offering, Father, and use it for your glory. Lord, would you minister to us now, Lord? Our heart is to be ministered by you, Father, to know your truth and to understand that truth within the context of each letter in your Bible, Lord, but also, Lord, to apply it to our lives. That's where the power comes in. When we willingly surrender to Jesus and allow him to live through us in the application of his word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Uh, I don't know about you, but every time Jesse sings that, that song, Abba, I Belong to You, yes. man, I just can't take that song. I'm going to have to ask him to stop. <laughs> And I just start weeping, you know, I'm a grown man. But that gets me every single time. I can't imagine, you know, I don't know if, if you're like me or not. Maybe you're not, your background is a little different. But most of my life, I have always... <clears throat> I've always sought out love somewhere. 
but it's always in the wrong place. <clears throat> and then Christ revealed to me his love, how much he loved me. And then he says, you belong to me. Yeah. And Abba means daddy, by the way. Mm -hmm. It means daddy. And when he sings that, it's like, daddy, I belong to you. I belong to Jesus. We all belong to Amen. Jesus. And belonging to Jesus means that he doesn't judge us, condemn us, ridicule us, mock us, belittle us, laugh at us. He receives us completely. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. That is amazing grace. And we all belong to him. So that just chokes me up every time I hear it. <sighs> okay. Open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we will be looking at verses 9 through 11. If you don't have a Bible, uh, raise your hand. I think we have a few back there, and Carlos will grab you one. <clears throat> but you need to have a Bible. If you don't have one, let us know. We, I believe, may have some for purchase. If not, then you go out and purchase a Bible. Find a bookstore or go online and get yourself a Bible. You need a Bible. And write your name in there. And you need a highlighter and you need a pen and you need to start taking notes and highlighting uh, the various scriptures that pop out at you and minister to you. And secondly, because you need to hear from the Lord. You don't need to hear from me. What I have to say doesn't mean much. It amounts to a hill of beans. But what Jesus has to say in his word matters a lot, and it will change your life. And so I, I hope that you'll hear him as you read along with us and, and see the words and read the words and let the word you know, cleanse your heart. <clears throat> so this morning's theme in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11 is, what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Okay. What has a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And that's a good question. And I think that's a question that needs to be answered because as you look at our world today, and, and you know this, I believe you know this with all your heart, you have a lot of people calling themselves Christians and they look just like the world. That's right. You can't tell the difference. And so there has to be a difference and I think that's what Paul is dealing with here. Within the context here, he's dealing with the Corinthians and how they ought to be different than the rest of the world their culture and their time, what they were doing. The Corinthians should have been separated. They should have been light. They should have been salt. They should have been distinct from the rest of the world that when people saw them, truly they would say, ah, oh, there is a Christian, truly a Christian, which means Christ-like. <clears throat> Paul also says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, let me read it to you, and you've heard this before. He says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. Right. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. Now, that's a picture of agricultural animals uh, being yoked together to plow a field. Now, if you want your field plow, you would take two ox, and you would yoke them together, and they would work together to plow your field so that you can plant your, your crops and then harvest them later. Now, he is illustrating the fundamental in compatibility between believers and unbelievers. And his point is this, two fundamentally different kind of animal yoked together will result in a disunity or a discord. So also are believers and unbelievers two fundamentally different types of people. Now can you imagine if a farmer decided, I'm going to take my two animals, yoke them together to plow my field, he takes an ox and then he puts a little pig next to the ox. <laughs> How do you think that field will look? As that ox is pulling everything, that little pig is just kind of being dragged alongside. I mean, you have two totally different animals. One that's designed to plow fields and give you milk. Another one designed to die and give you bacon. <laughs> you know? Not plowing. He has no idea what plowing is. He has no idea what work is because he's a pig and he lays in the slop all day long and he eats because they're fattening him up to eat him. And so you see that picture, how unnatural that looks? And so Paul is trying to make that point with 
people, with believers in Jesus Christ, that how can you as a believer be yoked up with somebody that has no idea what you even believe, who you trust in, who Jesus even is, and we're trying to make that relationship work, and yet it will not work. I don't know of one that has worked yet without a lot of hardship and heartaches. Any intimate relationship or spiritual par partnership between them will eventually and only result in a clash and difficulty. It will be a challenge. To partner them together and expect them to plow in the same direction is foolishness and will only end in spiritual disaster. And Paul is talking about this in these few verses here. Listen to the context, and this is important that we get the context of the scriptures. Context is always important. When I go to South Sudan, I'm going to make that point very clear. I'll have around nine to ten days to, to teach them how to study their Bibles, and the thing that I want to really drill into them is context, context, context. Who is Paul talking to? Who's the writer talking to? What is the culture and time? What is he saying within the whole chapter or two or three chapters and so forth? And we know from the context here that Paul has been talking about brothers suing brothers, taking them to court. Uh, we know that there's been lawsuits. And then earlier before that, we saw this, this uh, disruption within the church itself and that the church was to make judgment calls within the church and not outside the church. And he talked about wrongdoing. And if there's wrongdoing, we should be able and willing to take the wrong instead of suing our brothers before a secular court. So no secular court or jury is equipped to make spiritual decisions because they do not comprehend spiritual principles. You cannot go as a Christian to the courts in our society and expect them to understand what it is to be a Christian unless they are Christians. But they're to make their decisions based on secular laws. So how can we expect them to understand our battles with one another? And that's what Paul is dealing with here. We do not look to any worldly advice, including Oprah. <laughs> or Dr. Phil. Or The View. They're not Christians. Oh, they might call themselves Christians, but they are not biblical Christians. What is a biblical Christian? A biblical Christian is one who reads their Bible and understands through observation of the text and then the interpretation, then the application. And the application is very important. We oftentimes hear the observation. It's nice to hear the observation, what's going on, and the interpretation, but it's the application that we sometimes neglect. We should walk away saying, Lord, how can I implement that in my life? How can I be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only, deceiving myself? And so Oprah has nothing for us. Oprah has a worldview, mm -hmm. and it's a secular worldview. It's oftentimes a spiritual worldview. And when I say spiritual, I mean in a cultic way, not in a biblical way. Because spirituality can be anything. And oftentimes spirituality is based upon emotions and feelings. Right? My God loves me. Why? Because I am worthy to be loved. That's unbiblical. My God is going to bless me because he wants to bless all his children of all race, all cultures, all religions. That's my God. That's feelings. That is feelings. That's not based upon logic nor facts. And when you read the Bible, you find out that's unbiblical. Dr. Phil, though he may claim to be a Christian, he has very worldly advice from time to time. And the view, whew, they're really out there. <laughs> and I think as believers, you probably know that. Now, I'm not condemning them as people. God loves them. God hopes that they'll repent and turn to them. Um, I mean, they're wonderful shows. Millions of people see it. They get their wisdom from Dr. Phil and so forth. But I think it's unbiblical. And it's unwise for us as Christians to base our opinions and, and our philosophies on these people that have no idea what biblical truth is. This is why God has written his word for us from Genesis to Revelation, so that we can read it, understand it, and then apply it to our lives. So let me uh, give you just a, a real quick overview of where we are so far. We saw in verses 1 through 6 the Christian lawsuit that was taking place. They were going to secular courts, and they were suing one another on various issues, land issues, 
property issues, whatever it was. And then seven, Paul made it very clear, look, if you can't settle it as believers, then just take the wrong. So he stole your lawnmower. Go buy another lawnmower. You know, God will deal with him. Take the wrong. Um, and then 9 through 11, today we're going to look at this uh, thought, as I said in the theme itself, what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Well, nothing, as someone said. And then next week we're going to see that we are the temple of God, which is pretty amazing. To think God dwells within us, yes. right? Now, let me, let me clarify that just for a second. Because in spiritualism, Oprah, uh, Shirley MacLaine, they'll, they'll not say that God dwells in them. They'll say they are God. They'll say they are God. That's unbiblical. There's only one God. Amen. God dwells in us, but we're not God. They'll say they're God. I remember Shirley MacLaine wrote a book years ago, and she talked about that fact, that we are gods, and until we realize we are gods, then we will not be able to um, advance in our superiority in life and so forth. And so we need to tell ourselves every morning, looking in the mirror, you're a God. You're a God. You're a God. You're a God. And this way you get the, the positive attitude, you, you get it reinforced and speaking those words will make it come to a reality and so forth. And the church bought into that, right? During the, what, 90s, we had the faith and wealth doctrine movement pretty strong. And there was a time where the preachers on TBN were saying, look, if you have a wallet, just talk to it that there's money going to be in it and just keep saying it and money will appear. <laughs> and it's like, really? <laughs> I mean, it's, it, we laugh today, but back then this was serious stuff. People really believed this, the faith and wealth doctrine. And that's what you're going to claim. If you say it enough, it will really come true that you're God. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can just imagine God way up in heaven and they hear this little voice, I'm God, I'm God, I'm God. And God's going, hey guys, come over here, look at it. And there's Shirley McLean going, I'm God. And God's hearing this, I am God, I am God. This little speck on the earth saying that they're God. That's kind of ridiculous. Kind of ridiculous, so... God loves Shirley McLean, and hopefully she'll repent. Amen. Three points this morning. Unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then second point, sanctification and justification. We'll define those two words for you so that you know what, what they are. So let's read the text, verse 9 through 11. Do you not know, Corinthians, that the unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, or extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God, there is so much, amen, there is so much in this little text here, it is an amazing text, we could spend weeks in this little text, just defining those words, yes. just defining those words, but we're going to get through this this morning, so unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God, in verse 9 there, Paul makes it clear uh, with the statement it, that's in a rhetorical question, do you not know, and they knew that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so don't be deceived. And then he lists this, fornicator, adulterers, adulterers, homosexuals, and sodomites, and he'll go on. Now, as we continue in our Bible study, let's keep the context in mind. As verse 7 said, take a look at it, it is already a defeat for you, Paul said, the Corinthians, that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged, he said. Why not rather be defrauded? And then he said in verse 8, on the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. You do this even to your brethren. So his point is this, look, uh, you're suing one another. You're wronging one another. And you think that you're right, but ultimately in the end, you defraud your own brother. Even though you think you've been defrauded. You've done wrong yourself. You've defrauded others too. So why not just take the wrong? That's the context that Paul is talking with here. Now what he's saying is, is look. You are taking the offense and saying that you have been wrong, but you need to take the defense and realize that you're a sinner just like they are because you've done it too. That's basically what he's saying. You're just as sinful. Oftentimes that understanding will keep us from accusing others. 
of things. Because maybe you were accused and you get a little upset and you're angry and you want to just let them have it. And that little small voice in you says, how many times have you accused someone? It's like, ooh, mm-hmm. I've done the same thing. Right? Yes. And then we go, okay, Lord, I'll let it go. Great. You've learned your lesson that we're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. Mm-hmm. Let me read this to you in the Greek, Greek Amplified. Verse 9 says, Or do you Corinthians not know the ongoing consequences that the unrighteous, and the unrighteous are those who violate, who are sinful, and who do unjust things according to the scriptures. So he says that you unrighteous will literally, this is literally, it's a reality, not inherit continually the kingdom of God. So they will not, they understood this as Paul wrote it, that because of your practice of these things, this unrighteousness, you will literally not and continually not inherit the kingdom of God. You can't be more clear than that. You will not get into heaven. You will not be knocking on that door. God will see you and say, I do not know you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. And Paul's making that very clear to them, that if you're part participating and partaking in these type of sins, then you are just as guilty as the party that you're suing. And you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, like the rabbis of Paul's time, Paul engages in this rhetorical uh, damnation here in, in the way that he words this. He has expelled from fellowship only the most extreme offenders. And we saw that in, in chapter 5, verse 1, as the son, uh, stepson was sleeping with his mother-in-law, right? And he said, get her out of there. Get him out of the church. You need to correct this. And so he expelled them. And yet those who continue in the lifestyle that he mentions here, whether it's premarital sex or materialism, he makes it very clear they'll not inherit the kingdom of God. Because there's a big difference. And the difference is what? That they're practicing these things. They're practicing these things. So he goes on and says, do not be continually deceived, continually. In the Greek, it's emphasizing the continual thing. In other words, they are being deceived continually, but then continually. So they are literally oblivious to what they're doing. They think it's normal. They think it's okay. What's wrong with it? In fact, if you stand before a court of law, they'll defend what they're doing because they don't see it as being wrong continually. Now, the word deceive there means to cause to stray, to lead astray, lead aside from the right way, to wander or roam about, to lead into air, or to be led aside. And in this case, they are being led aside by something outside of them because this is in the passive voice. And so something outside of them is leading them and deceiving them. Who could that be? Satan himself is deceiving them. And it could be their passions for these things. I don't know about you, but sin is pleasurable, Moses said, for a season. We enjoy sin. And sin can be pleasurable, depending on the kind of sin that you're doing, whether it's pride or arrogance or some sexual sin. It is pleasurable, but it's only for a season. And the repercussions of that sin always leads to death, Paul said, for the wages of sin is death. And so it's always giving you a wage of death, destruction in your livelihood. So this is an outside source causing them to be deceived continually and continually. And then he lists these things. And I'm going to define them for you um, real quickly as, as we are, as I said, we're looking at the unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God. And these are those that practice these things continually and they won't stop because they think it's okay to practice as a human being. Uh, They've created a God that says fornicating, adultery, uh, idol worshiping is all okay. I believe in that. I think it's okay. We ought to just let people live the way they want to live. Well, that's incorrect according to the Bible. So he first mentions here fornicators. What is a fornicator? Real quick. It's a man or woman who prostitutes his body to another's lust. And it's oftentimes for hire during the time of Paul. But it's also a man who indulges in unlawful sexual intercourse. So it's having a relationship with someone outside of marriage. Very clear, very simple. If you're not married and you're having sexual relationships, then you are committing 
fornication. Now, in our society today, that is so common. Yeah. Very common. You go to the universities, and it happens all the time. They are fornicating just because they want to please their bodies. They call it hooking up. Let's just hook up. We're not going to stay together. We're not going to have a relationship. You know, we're just going to hook up, please one another, and move on to the next uh, relationship whenever we have the urge. That's fornicating, and that's so common. And it's so well uh, received today because there's nothing like it. Why? Because we've all evolved from animals, and animals are just like that. And so why shouldn't we act out upon those feelings and those emotions? Paul says, no, fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of God if they continue to practice those things. Nor idolaters. Now we know what idolaters are. They worship uh, false gods. So idolaters are those who worship false gods in, in contrast to the true God, the God of the Bible. A person that's not an idolater will be the person that worships the God of the Bible as the Bible describes that God. We know the God to be a trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're to worship Him in truth and in spirit. And so we worship that God. That God is Jesus Christ and His Father. And the Holy Spirit is the one that leads us to worship Him. Any other, any others is false worship. Now you might worship a philosophy. And there are people that worship logic. Let's just think logically. Let's look at life logically. And if we look at life logically, then we come up with an interpretation of, of how we ought to live life. And so they worship logic. Or they worship some other cultic group or spirituality, as we mentioned earlier. Or they worship themselves. And oftentimes, more often than, than not, because of the fall of man in Genesis, and I'm sure Justin Alfred talked about it last week, you know, go back to Genesis chapter 3, and what did the woman uh, uh, do? She partook of the fruit because the enemy said what? That she'd become like God. And that's all of our struggle, is that we want to be God. And so we create our own God. What we want, what we like. Even as Christians, sometimes we fall into that. And that's why it's, we need to be careful, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians, that we need to examine our faith to see whether we're in the faith or not. Because sometimes we'll create our own God. <clears throat> An example of that could be, you know, someone might hurt you and you might want vengeance. Well, see, God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We need to let vengeance uh, be in his hands and not our own. We're, ne we're to forgive. But what we do is we know, I'm, I've been hurt. I'm justified to do something back to them. Now you've created a false God. Because you're telling yourself, that's what God would have me to do, my God. But God really wouldn't have you to do that. And so we do that with a lot of other different things. So neither will idolaters who continue to practice those things inherit the kingdom of God. Nor adulterers. Adulterers are faithless towards God and they're ungodly. These are people that are married and they commit sexual sin outside of their marriage. Now I, no I, I noticed here in the Greek definition of this, this word here that Paul uses for the Corinthians. It's faithless towards God. And that's interesting. Faithless towards God. Isn't that interesting? It's not saying faithless towards their husband or spouse. It's saying faithless towards God. So, there, so our relationships with our spouses is more than just us. It's based upon our relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And when we commit adultery, we're being faithless towards God. That's interesting. Infamates. Or as the New King James might say, sodomites. Now this is interesting. This is an interesting word. You might not have heard this before because we all know that what sodomite is, you're thinking immediately homosexual. But he mentions homosexual in the next statement here. So it's, it is homosexual, but it yet it's a little different in its definition. The definition of a sodomite or effeminate is a soft touch. A soft touch. A male who submits his body to unnatural lewdness. Here's what the dictionary says. Having traits, taste, habits, etc., traditionally considered feminine as softness and delicacy. Isn't that interesting? What do we see today? You can, you can scan your Instagram and you'll see these guys with these very soft and feminine traits. And then they're putting makeup on like women and so forth. So he's not necessarily saying that these are practicing homosexual acts, but they're practicing feminine traits.
crates instead of being men or women practicing male. And so they put on this softness, this, this delicacy, you know, don't touch me, you know, kind of thing and so forth. And we're seeing more and more of that. So this is an interesting word here. It, it gets to the core and the heart of the issue, not just the actual act, though the act is sinful. We'll see in a moment. And then the next one he says, nor homosexuals, one who lies with a male as a female. And that's very clear. Now let me just say a couple of things about these, these words here before we go on. Uh, since this is such a clear condemnation of homosexuality in these last two specifically, those who would like to justify the practice, Paul says, is speaking of homosexual prostitution, not a loving, caring, homosexual relationship. So there are those who say, well, Paul is talking about prostitution. He's not talking about people who really love each other in a relationship, like two men and two women who fall in love with each other and they become married and they commit to one another. He's not talking about that. But if you really look at this in the context, and I think you'll agree with me, there is no doubt that God is speaking of the homosexual act of any kind here, of any kind. Now, Paul wasn't writing to a community of homophobics as a culture. This was happening rampant at his time, just like it is today. You know, they will call Christians homophobic, but we really aren't homophobic. We just understand that it's sin in the eyes of God, along with these other things, right? Yes. See, homosexuality was rampant in Paul's culture. 14 out of the first 15 Roman emperors were bisexual or homosexual. Now, I don't know if all of you know this, but bisexual means that they had no preference, male or female. So 14 out of the 15 were bisexual or homosexual. At the very time Paul was writing this, Nero was emperor. He had taken a boy named Sophris who had him castrated. He then married him with full ceremony. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine this happening in the White House? This is what was happening in their time and culture. Brought him to the palace with a great procession. I mean, it would be like a president and having it televised and they're having this great ceremony with the gowns and everything and, and procession and music and the whole thing. And he made this boy his wife. So it wasn't unusual for Paul to speak about these things. Later, Nero, this is how crazy he gets, he lived with another man and he declared the other man, uh, the, or the other man declared him, Nero, to be his wife. So this is how deluded and it got. Uh, and that's ultimately where it leads to. It leads to just odor, just debase uh, animal instincts of debauchery and so forth. Uh, you may have seen it on Facebook the other day, but they had a procession of homosexuals and uh, gays and lesbians and so forth, and they had children dressed like them along in this procession. Now, children can't make up their own mind. Contrary to popular decision, you let your children make up their own mind. Children do not make up their mind. You instill in children truth. You don't let children go. They're going to do what they see you doing because they're children and they're formed and fashioned that way. Now, one more point, though, before we, we go on. And we have to notice this as Christians, and I want to make it clear. Uh, that homosexuality is right along with the other sins here. You notice that? Many of them, or many of which those uh, who so strongly denounce homosexuality are themselves guilty of. Because as we saw the list here, there were idolaters, there were revilers, we'll see that in a minute, and it's listed right along with homosexuality. Now, can fornicators or adulterers or covetous or drunkenness rightly condemn homosexuals? Of course not, because they're just as guilty. See, Christians err when they excuse <clears throat> homosexuality and deny that it is sin. But they also err just as badly when they single it out as sin, as a sin to God. And uniquely, God is angry at that sin. And that's not the case. <clears throat> we have to understand that <clears throat> sin is sin and it's going to lead to destruction of whatever it is. So... Even though we see it in our society today, and it may not be as bad as the time of Rome, it's still sin in God's eyes, as so is drunkenness. 
so is thievery, so is reviling or swindling or a robber or a thief. It's just as bad and will separate you from God. So let's read the, the rest of this as Paul continues. Look at verse 10. <clears throat> he says, nor thieves will enter the kingdom of God. And that's just a theft of any kind, whatever it is, that continually practice thievery or covetousness. And that's anyone who is eager to have more than what they have, uh, what belongs to others. Right? They just covet those things. How many of us err in that sometimes? Okay. Right? But the thing is, is that we realize it, and we pray about it, and we ask God to take those covetous feelings away. So neither will covetous people inherit the kingdom of God. And I can go on, I can go on with that just as much as I went on with homosexuality. Because there are a lot of covetous people in our world today. It's all about, these keep up with the Joneses, you know. What they have, I want, and, and so forth. Nor drunkards. That's pretty clear. What's a drunkard? He's a person that's intoxicated, who has no ability to govern over his own body because he drank too much. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. No revilers. Now, what is that? A railer. What is a railer? Let me define this in the dictionary. It means to utter bitter complaints. Wow. Wow, that's a railer. Wouldn't it be neat if we had someone that complained, complained, we get t-shirts that says railer. <laughs> that's a person that all they do all day long is complain, 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 complain. That's their practice. That's their God to complain because their God complains all the time. That's a person that's not trusting in God, by the way. They're not trusting in God. Uh, I can see that easily being an issue here with, with uh, our food ministry, right? Complain, complain, complain. You know. Where's the filet mignon? I'm waiting for the filet mignon. You know, where's this? I like this. How come you don't have any of that? <laughs> I don't know. Take that up with God. <laughs> if he provides, then we'll give it out. But whatever he provides, that means God is providing then we should receive it, especially if you're in line and you signed your name to receive it. You're saying, God, I will receive what you give me. That's what you're saying. But what we do is, God, I will receive what you give me as long as it's what I want. That's what we're saying when we <laughs> complain. So, you know what? Revilers will not inherit the kingdom of God if they continue to practice that. There's something to be said about positive thinking. We should think positive. We should trust in God. We should, should be saying, Lord, provides for Amen. us. And we'll trust that he'll provide for us. And he'll meet our needs. He'll take care of us in his way, in his timing. So I remember my dad, <clears throat> as a 13-year-old, running away from home. And he would tell us stories on how he lived out there in the world from Florida to California, picking oranges and orange groves in Florida. And sometimes all we would have is a jar of peanut butter. I'm like, I listen to that story. I'm like, how do you survive down on a jar? You do. Or a jar of mayonnaise. That's all I could afford. You know? And he goes, and I was grateful for that, that I could even have that. We should be grateful for what God has for us. Nor swindlers. A swindler is a robber, an extortioner. A swindler is one who tries to swindle you out of things. I got an interesting call real quick. It was, I was in, in El Paso. I worked for Southern California Edison and I, I had uh, left early to go full time in ministry. But this guy calls me up and says, Mr. Solis. I said, yes, I am with Southern California Edison and I am calling to let you know that we have a crew going out to your site there to shut your power off because of non-payment. And I said, really? Wow, I'm in El Paso, what am I gonna do? Okay, thank you very much. I'll talk to you later. He goes, no, 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 hang on, Mr. Solis, hang on. I'm like, oh, what? Now I'm playing him because I know what he's doing. He's trying to swindle me out of money. So now I'm having fun. This is what I do. And I said, what do I do? You know, he's like, he goes, I, I got the solution. What I want you to do is go to any, any store like Rite Aid or Walmart and go to the gift card section. And there's an area that says utilities and you buy a gift card and you put $498 on it. And I'm like, really? I can do that? Okay, thank you. I really appreciate your help. I'll do that first thing in the morning. No, no, hang on, Mr. Sol. Don't hang up yet. No, you need to do it right now. And you do it right now. Go and do that. I'm like, okay, I'll run over and do it. Um, how do I give it to you? Here's a number. I want you to call, call it back. And then we'll take your payment and we'll stop the crew from coming. But you only have 20 minutes to do that because they're on their way. 
And I'm like, all right, okay, I'll, I'll try to do it as quickly as I can. Thank you so much. Goodbye. He goes, no, no, hang on, hang on. One more thing. When you go there and you put that money on there, don't tell them what you're doing because these guys are crooks in these Rite Aids and Walmarts. What they'll do, they're going to charge you $5. But if they find out that you're using it to pay the utility, they're going to charge you $60. And you don't want to get charged $60 because they're ripping you off. So make sure you don't say anything. You just get the card, you pay it, and don't tell them why you're using it, you know, what you're using it for, okay? I'm like, wow, thank you. You just saved me a lot of money. I really appreciate that. And so I said, I'll be doing it right. He goes, okay, give me a call in a little bit. I'm like, all right. And then I just went on my business. <laughs> I just, I, you know, I took up 40 minutes so he couldn't get someone else. It's basically what I was doing. And about 40 minutes later, he actually calls me up. We're still waiting for you. I, can, I have so much power, I can't. I'm like, I go, I know you're a swindler. How do you know? Because I work for Southern California Edison. I know how it works. Well, tell me how you really knew. And I'm like, no, you want to know so that others, you know, uh, can't, can't be swindled. No, I'm not telling you how I know. I just knew. I go, you're a swindler, and it's ridiculous that you do this to people. And he hung up on me. That's a swindler. And we see him around there. Don't ever give people your money. Don't ever think that, and no one ever calls you to tell you you owe money. They're going to go through the process of mailing you something, and then you call them up to always verify these things. Don't be, don't be deceived of these. And they do target older people. It's usually the elderly. Wow, I just gave away my age. <laughs> <laughs> so nor swindlers, he says, will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says will literally not inherit forever the kingdom of God. So he makes it very clear. Now, let me make this clear. He's not saying that if you do these things at one time or fall into them, as some of us oftentimes do, because we can swindle people out of things. We can have certain thoughts, because Jesus said uh, adultery starts in the heart and fornication and those kind of things. So we don't practice it, though. That's the difference. We realize that it's wrong, we confess it, and then we do everything we can to not practice those sins. So he's talking about people that practice it, and they're deceived, and they think that it's okay to do those things. Now, second point is sanctification, verse 11, and we'll go through this quickly. Let's read verse 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, this is clearly God's work in us. Paul describes God's work in three terms, washed, sanctified, and justified. Now, Paul ends with this great statement to the Corinthians, such were continually some of you. And the word were there is in the past. What he's saying to the Corinthians is you're not like this. You were like this at one time, but you are not like this anymore. You never act like this anymore. You know that it's wrong. You confess it. You change your ways and your desires. But there was a time when you did do these things continually, and God saved you. So clearly, these sins characterize those who will not inherit the kingdom of God, but Christians can never be unloving or uncaring towards those unbelievers. Because they are right where they used to be. You get that? Yes. Because we realize we were there too. So we should have a love for these people. We should have a love for homosexuals. We should love them. We should reveal that God loves them very much and doesn't want them to live in that manner. I went to a conference last year and there was an individual that, <clears throat> that was a homosexual, lived his whole lifestyle, and then the Lord put him in prison and he read the Bible. And by the way, he actually went to Bible study. And in Bible study, he brought it before the Lord, before the pastor of that Bible study. And they said, oh, no, don't worry about it. God loves you all. And he just kind of like, that doesn't sound right. So he read the Bible and he realized, no, that's not true. God loves us all, but he doesn't want us living that way. Right. So he chose, though he's a homosexual, he has those feelings and those emotions. He chooses to live a celibate life. <coughs> and he has a ministry to homosexuals. And he helps them to get out of it and live a life that glorifies Christ, even Amen. though they have those tendencies. Amen. Now you might be, at, there's so much on this that I could talk about. You might be asking, well, well, then why do they have those tendencies? God made them that way. They were born. No, he did not. 
we always, we always forget the fact that God created Adam and Eve. And he created them perfectly. And they sinned and brought sin into the world. And part of that sin is the fact that our flesh has been amplified through that sin. Because of sin, it kills us. And so our DNA has been changed and corrupt. Our personalities have been changed and corrupt because sin destroys. And that's what exactly what it did at the garden. So when you get these people who say, no, I was born this way. Yes, you were born that way. But it's the result of sin that you were born that way. Because God did not create you that way. Nor did he intend you to live that way. And we have to understand that. Though you might think, well, but there's scientists. Again, what does the unbelieving world have to do with believers? These scientists don't know what they're talking about. God created us. He knows what he, where he's talking about. God knows what he's talking about. He created the most inner parts. You know the word matrix? We saw the movie Matrix. That matrix word comes from Jeremiah. It means the most inner part workings. That was the whole movie intent was, was how is this world created? And it's a bunch of people in little tubes, you know, being shown, shown uh, videos on their lives. Well, the reality is God created us and every part within us, God created us to be good. And so <clears throat> we need to love them because they're confused and they need the love of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul experienced this type of transformation, right? He was once like them. Oh, he might have had a religious background and wouldn't touch any of these, but he, he was an idolater. He was a covetous man because the Pharisees and Sadducees and Sanhedrins were very religious people and they used the system to get wealthy and rich. So Paul understood this and he had a transformation so he could say, we were like that, including himself, but we're not like that anymore. He says, we were washed. And the word washed there means we were cleansed from our sins because of the mercy of of God, Titus 3, 5. We have been, or we have our sins washed by the calling on the name of Jesus Christ, Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. Because we called on his name, though he washed us. We are washed by the work of Jesus on the cross for us, Revelation 1, 5. And by the word of God, Ephesians 5, 22. God has washed us. He has cleansed us by the work that he did through his son, Jesus Christ. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercies, he saved us by the washing of the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. That's how he washed us. Not only washed, he says, you were literally, it's a matter of fact in the Greek, sanctified. And the word sanctified means to render or declare holy, to separate from one thing which is profane and dedicate it to God. And so at one point, you were defamed and dirty, and God then gave you over to his kingdom, cleansed you, and separated you for a good work. That's all the word means. Hallelujah. You've been sanctified, set apart for the work of God now. Now, we have to walk in that. We have to walk in that. I'm a sanctified saint, and so I have to walk in a right way, and I choose to walk that way. Now, John 17 says that this sanctification came from the word of God, obviously, we, know, we need to understand the word of God that it tells us that God has separated us unto his work. And it also came by faith in Jesus Christ, Acts 26, 18. And the Holy Spirit is the one who sets us apart, Romans 15, 16. This means that Christ is on our side and all believers are brothers in Christ. Now he's saying this for a reason. Don't be suing each other because we're all sanctified. We're all washed we're all justified. Because you might think of that other person, oh, you wicked, you call yourself a Christian. <laughs> Look, that's not our job. That's not our job. Paul never told that young man who was sleeping with his mother-in-law, you're not a Christian. You're not a believer. He never said that. He said, I give you over to the Lord. That he take your body so that you be saved. So what he said, because he couldn't judge the heart. We don't know the heart of man. And oftentimes sin can grab a hold of us so hard and we don't want it, but yet it has a hold of us and we don't know how to get out of it. Like you're drowning in an ocean of water and the life raft is right there and you just can't reach it. And for whatever reason, you're trying, you're trying, you're trying. And I know people who don't deal with a certain type of sin, they'll say, oh, you should be able to just grab that thing. That's not as easy as you think. It might be easy for you, but you have vices or sins that no one else may know about. 
We all are there. We all are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. I mean, I wish I could say we're all holy saints and none of us do anything wrong. But that ain't the truth. That ain't the truth. Now, you might try to hide it from others, but God knows our heart. So, be careful. Paul is saying this for a reason. We're justified. Third point. What does justify mean? And again, we're literally, actually justified. This is a matter of fact. It means to render righteous. You're already righteous, which is interesting. In other words, you're not sinners. I know we call ourselves sinners, and we do sin, and we fall short, but we're no longer sinners. We are justified children of God. We're righteous because of Jesus Christ. He has imputed his righteousness to us. It would be like, it would be like someone saying, you know, uh, we put that diamond through all of the pressure, and they can make, they can make what do they call it, zirconium? They make these diamonds, right? They make them. And we can say, we made this diamond a diamond. But some come along, no, it's just, it's just dirt and coal. No, it's not. It's a diamond. It literally is. I don't care how many times you say it's just dirt, but it's a diamond. We made it into a diamond. That's what it is. God says we're righteous. So we are literally righteous in the Greek here. It actually means you're righteous, all of us. Yeah, we sin, and we confess it, but we're still righteous. We're not guilty. We're no longer guilty. And, and, a great, and a great example of that, right, is the thief on the cross. Amen. Yes. That's something to rejoice over, yes. that we're not guilty before God. Not of our works, but the works of Jesus Christ. We are justified by God's grace through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, Romans 3.24. And by faith and not by our own deeds, Romans 3.28. It's all what Jesus did. How great is the work of God in our lives? The third reason my brother is capable of being a judge, is that his sins are already forgiven as mine are. So you don't take your brother to law. Your sins are forgiven just as his sins are forgiven. And we need to forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us, as Peter said. So again, Paul in context is trying to get to the point to stop bickering and fighting among each other and love each other the way that Christ intended us to love each other because we're all saved. Let me close up with this. Jesus stood before the judges of this world, right? He stood before Pilate himself. And this secular judge proclaimed him innocent before his own people because legally he had done nothing wrong. Though he did not understand what Jesus was doing or who he was, he had no spiritual insight, but yet he said he's Innocent according to Roman law. He stood before the judges. Now, that indictment and judgment didn't matter. Didn't matter at all because the fact is Jesus was guiltless. And the fact is Jesus was going to do what he needed to do. So even if he did not stand before a judge, he would have had to still go to the cross. <clears throat> Jesus also stood before his own people, his own culture. And they all said he was guilty. Sometimes it's your own family that says you're guilty. And they judged him before the crowds crucify him, crucify him. His own people. How sad that is. But then it was his own children, his real family, the disciples. Oh, well, they didn't know exactly who he was, but they knew he was the Messiah. And they came back that next day. And they saw that he had resurrected from the dead. Oh, and they met him in the upper room. Yes. And they waited for the Holy Spirit. And they knew that Jesus was the Messiah. You see, true family, true family understands. True family Amen. knows. We might have doubts, might have concerns, but we're going to trust in God. That God has a work to be done here. Mm -hmm. Jesus is a perfect example of how we ought to treat one another. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we come before you as believers in Christ Jesus, Lord. And we thank you, Father, for your precious word that you have instruction for us as believers and as we work through situations with one another, Lord. It was challenging today, Lord. There's a lot here. And I pray that we'll take it back in prayer and ask in the power of the Holy Spirit if God can help us somehow, Lord, to get through these issues that we're dealing with, Lord. May you fill us with the Holy Spirit. May you forgive us Lord, of our sins and our shortcomings, Lord. And if there's anyone here, Lord, who does not know Jesus Christ, I pray that they surrender their lives to Jesus right now. That they would just simply say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. 
I don't understand everything that the pastor said, but I get some of it. I get the thought that I need Jesus. And so please help me come into my heart and give me a hunger for the word and for fellowship. Save me, Lord. Give me eternal life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Let's stand and we will close with this song. And then we have a special lunch pizza from Costco. So if you want to stick around and fellowship, we would love to meet you. God bless you. In the glory.